This is going to be my second video update for the day, Saturday, June 24th. And uh, I am back at the monument to uh, the fallen Greek heroes here in Larnaca, Cyprus. I don't know why I came back here, but I decided to come back here and do my second video update from this spot dedicated to fallen heroes. And uh, I guess with everything that has happened in the, uh, in the Prigozhin case, you had a hero, a man who, who was considered a hero. And I guess he has fallen, but in a different way, in a much different way. And uh, I remember when I did a video in uh, in Ayanapa, and I showed the statue of, of Icarus flying too close to the sun. I guess that that sums up Prigozhin. And uh, we did a, a live stream, me and Alexander, on the Duran. We talked about what. Uh, what was unfolding in Russia, specifically in the Rostov and Don region with this Prigozhin mutiny. What we had was Prigozhin either, either acting on his own and recruiting some Wagner soldiers, or there are rumors circulating the interwebs, tough to confirm, but there are rumors saying that perhaps there were some foreign actors involved, some foreign influence involved in order to to get Prigozhin to the point where he he rebels against Russia, the Russian government and the Russian military. Who knows? Who knows what drove Prigozhin to take this action? Uh, I've 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 given my my thoughts on it. I'm sure everyone has their their thoughts as to why he would do such a thing. But uh, Putin gave his speech, and uh, he addressed the Russian people, a very powerful speech. And uh, Putin has been left with no choice but to, to stomp this, this mutiny out and to do it quickly. He has to do it quickly, because uh, this has done a lot of damage, not only to, to Russia internally and to, let's say, the, the military and... Uh, and everything that's going on in this conflict, but this has done a lot of damage to Russia on the international uh, stage. And the Russian uh, foreign ministry is going to have to, to work uh, double time now. They're going to have to work a lot over this weekend to do some damage control because China, India, South Africa, Brazil, the BRICS nations, um, Iran, much of South America, African uh, nations, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Asia, they're all going to look at this and, and they're going to uh, start to, to question the stability of the, the Putin government. That's the damage that this has done to, to Russia on the international stage. All the work that was put in to create the dynamics of, of a diplomatic win in this war between uh, Russia and and the collective West and NATO, it's been it's been severely damaged by this action from Prigozhin. Now a lot of countries outside the collective West, they've had to deal with their own uh, mutinies, let's say their own internal mutinies, whether it's China dealing with say what happened in Hong Kong or. Or other countries that have had to deal with these types of things, so they're they're familiar with uh, these types of incidences. Incidences. I don't even know if that's a word. <laughs> these types of things happening in their own country. So, you know, while things are are bad from the the optics uh, level, uh, it's it's nothing that can't be uh, recovered from. It's nothing that the the Ministry of uh, the foreign ministry of Russia can't 
can't deal with and, and you are dealing with the best uh, one of the best uh, foreign ministries in the world and experienced diplomats who will find a way to use diplomacy to engage with uh, with their friends and and partners in in this multipolar world and they'll find a way to to deal with this and to keep them on side but this does happen at a time when you are going to have Newland and Sullivan in Copenhagen. I don't know when they're scheduled to be in Copenhagen. I think, I think in the next week or two, if I uh, if I remember correctly from that Financial Times article. But you are going to have uh, Sullivan and neocon Newland. They're going to be in Copenhagen having this open, this like open mic. That's what I call it, an open mic event, where they're inviting uh, Turkey and. And uh, I believe South Africa, Brazil, India, China, the BRICS countries without Russia, of course. And they're inviting them to Copenhagen and they're going to convince them why Russia is not a good partner and why Russia is not stable and why they should turn their backs on Russia. So this so the timing of this is 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 perfect for for Newland and Sullivan. And of course, it's perfect for the Alecki regime. It completely distracts away from the failures, the catastrophe that is the counteroffensive. And uh, it gives the Aletsky regime and all of NATO uh, something to talk about in Vilnius. And it will give NATO the, uh, the case, they can make the case, to, to fast-track Ukraine's entry into NATO, to give Ukraine more money, more weapons. Because, as I said in my morning video, the narrative is going to be that they're very close to achieving the coup that they have wanted for so many years so many decades one can say they're very close to achieving this coup that is going to be the the argument that they're going to put out there when they meet in nato and uh and that's why they're going to to push for more money and more weapons to the alensky regime so that they can eventually crack the russian military and the russian leadership that's that's what this has done this bonehead terrible despicable uh action from Prigozhin. And that's what it is. And Putin said, said as much. Putin is going to have to crack down on this quickly. I imagine by tomorrow he'll have this under control. And, uh, and then Russia has to do damage control on all levels, domestic and the military and uh, international, on an international foreign policy level as well. And a lot of people are talking about uh, the, the contracts and how this might have been the the spark that set off Prigozhin. I think it, I think the whole Wagner contract thing, which no, none of us really know what the details of, of the contract situation was with Wagner fighters, um, perhaps transitioning, shifting over to, to the Russian military and what, what the contracts uh, were saying or what differences they were in compensation or or duties or anything like that. No one really knows uh, what the details were. I mean, the people that have the contracts know, but I don't know uh, what was going on with, with the contracts of Wagner and folding Wagner uh, deeper into the Russian military. Um, whatever the situation was, I can definitely see that Prigozhin um, would use this in order to, uh, to get some some disgruntled soldiers on side with him like i could see him leveraging some uh, contract disputes with ver where with various wagner soldiers and manipulating it so that you know he could tell them look you know the the russian military is going to pay you x amount or they're going to i don't know station you here or, or whatever they're going to treat you this way and come with me and we're not going to put up with this we're protesting this we're protesting wagner being uh absorbed by the Russian military. It's almost like a company takeover. Think of it like, as like a, one company taking over another, right? A big company swallows up, uh, buys out a small company, and, uh, and you're going to have employees and maybe even a manager or two who are going to say, we're not going to put up with this. We're, we're protesting. And I can, see, I, I can see how that's kind of similar to what's happening. But the protest that Prigozhin put out there is, I mean, he really effed up. I mean, he really effed up. So, so Prigozhin doesn't need money. Uh, he's a billionaire. He's got plenty of money. So I don't think this was about money for Prigozhin. I think this was about power and ego and, uh, and Icarus flying too close to the sun. And he probably didn't like the fact that uh, 
that the Russian military is now taking things over and he's being marginalized. And, uh, and maybe there was foreign interference as well. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it wouldn't surprise me. But, uh, but there's a lot of talk about that um, around Russia, a lot of talk about foreign interference. And um, the, the Russian leadership, they're closing ranks around Putin. They're supporting Putin. Maria Zakharova came out with a statement fully in support of Putin, calling for unity. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev, he called for unity, fully in support of Putin. Um, Putin called this treacherous or treasonous. Uh, Dmitry Medvedev said something along the same lines. Uh, Kadyrov, Kadyrov, who actually had a good relationship with, uh, with Prigozhin. I mean, Kadyrov actually liked Prigozhin. Prigozhin liked Kadyrov. They respected each other. Kadyrov came out and he said this, is a, this was a, a, sta a backstabbing, a treacherous act. Actually, per, uh, actually, Kadyrov hinted that this may have been uh, a traitorous uh, act that Prigozhin traded, to the, traded sides to the collective West. He's a traitor. So for Kadyrov to come out and say that, it means that, you know, Prigozhin is, is done for. I mean, he's, he's screwed, man. He is. <laughs> Kadyrov and him got along. And uh, Kadyrov is in full support of Putin and the government. And, uh, and all the governors and mayors across Russia, they're showing support. Actually, Alexander sent me a message just before I recorded this video. And he said that the Communist Party has now come out in full support of uh, of the president and the government and the communist party is, is is a big party i mean it's i think it's the number two party in russia so they do have a lot of power and uh and they're in full uh full support of putin the government so so this thing will be handled it just has to be handled quickly and then and then in my opinion the foreign ministry which is the best foreign ministry one of the best foreign ministries they're going to have to work the phones and they're going to have to you know use diplomacy and use their expertise to to make sure that that their friends and allies and partners are uh, are not spooked off by all of this and are not enticed by by Newland and Sullivan bringing gifts. So uh, that is the latest update with what is happening with this Purgosian incident. I don't think I have anything else to say. Um, Duda, he's one of the first Collective West leaders who came out with a statement saying that he's monitoring the situation closely, but. You know, you know, you know, walk on the wild side, Duda is, is pretty happy about this, uh, this development. As I called it in my video from the morning, as I, as I entitled my video in the morning, this was a gift, an absolute gift to the collective West. And it's, this is going to prolong the conflict. That's all Prigozhin did. He's, he's uh, prolonged the conflict and the suffering and the death and, and the escalation. Terrible, a terrible uh, thing that he did. Terrible thing that he did. So, uh, let's see. Modi, since I mentioned uh, keeping Russia's friends on side, Modi was in... Uh, he was... Let me see how I'm doing on time. All right, not bad. Not bad. He was in D.C. And uh, what a trip for Modi and for India. Boy, did Modi get everything he... Uh, he asked for from the Biden White House. And, and the best part about it is that Modi, you know, he, uh, he rolled into DC and, you know, he laid down the, the law. He's like, you know, look, I'm coming here. I want to talk business. I want to talk partnership and cooperation. I have a good relation with the US, but I also have a good relation with Russia. Uh, we have excellent ties with, uh, with Russia, historically excellent ties with Russia, so don't, so don't uh, make these this this meeting here in. Uh, what is that? It looks like a place to to barbecue. Actually, <laughs> interestingly enough, it's like a barbecue pit is what it looks like over there, but it's all closed off. Interesting. Sometimes you never know what you stumble upon as you walk the streets. <laughs> um, so yeah, Modi was like, you know, look, don't don't make this this meeting about trying to get me to turn my back on uh, on Russia because it's not in our interests. And and in my opinion, Biden, the Biden White House said, okay, we won't make this about Russia. But what they did make this about, what they did make the meeting about, was 
was China, and they uh, they basically uh, courted India to try and get India on side so that they can use India as some sort of leverage against the uh, the rise of China. That, that was pretty much the meeting, and and you know Modi he he understood exactly what's going on and. And he made the Biden White House pay a very heavy price. And whatever he asked for from Biden, whatever deals he, he asked for, whatever business he asked for, whatever military things he asked for, Biden gave him everything. I mean, Biden gave him everything. The Biden White House, they've dug themselves in such a hole that, uh, that on a foreign policy level, they, they, they really don't have much leverage with, with many countries, to be quite honest, or at least... A powerful country like India, they can uh, they can travel to D.C. and they can say, "Look, you know your diplomacy is a mess. You need us. You need to to have good relations with us because we're also a part of BRICS. China is rising. China is is your number one competitor, and uh, you need our business." And in the Biden White House, they uh, they have no other options. They have to go along with it. So that was the, the meeting in, uh, in D.C. between Modi and Biden. And of course, the video of, of the Indian national anthem playing. And Biden thought it was the U.S. national anthem. And he was like <laughs> putting his hand over his heart. And then he realized it was not the U.S. national anthem. And he started to lower his hand, you know, like he thought he was being slick. You know, Biden thought he was being you know, real, real, real slick and sly. He's like lowering his hand really slow. Maybe no one's going to notice as they see me lowering my hand. <laughs> oh, Bidenopolis, <laughs> Greece's favorite son. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, let's see here. I have no idea where I'm walking towards. <laughs> I've got the walking on the street here. That's not a great, not such a great idea. Let me cross over to the other side. If I get the chance. So let's talk a little bit about the 11th sanctions package. A very little about, very little bit about the 11th sanctions package. And basically the EU passed an 11th sanctions package on Russia. And they're actually going after RT in the Balkans as well. Uh, RT has, has a presence in the Balkans and they're trying to, to shut that down as well. But... 11 sanctions package, you know, going after countries that uh, help Russia circumvent the first 10 <laughs> sanctions packages. <laughs> That's basically the 11 sanctions package. We're going to go after entities, governments, businesses <laughs> that are helping Russia circumvent the first 10 sanctions. <laughs> there you go. There you go. What a, what a joke. <laughs> what a joke this has become. The whole sanctions thing is a clown world. The first 10 sanctions packages worked out so well <laughs> that they're going to go with an 11th. And what's the purpose of the 11th? Is to try and uh, to try and stop people from bypassing the first 10. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. So uh, that's the sanctions package that was passed a couple of days ago. And before I get to my clown world, what is going on in Ukraine with the super duper catastrophic counter offensive? By the way, uh, there are reports that the whole Prigozhin thing, it hasn't, it hasn't stopped the, the Russian military from there. They're advancing in, uh, in Ukraine because the one army that is advancing in Ukraine in the big counteroffensive is actually the Russian military, specifically in uh, the Kupiansk, Marinka direction. So the Russian military, they keep on repelling the Ukraine military. They keep on advancing. It hasn't so far. The effects of Prigozhin and what he did, and what Prigozhin did has not affected the Russian military. That's what I want to say. So far, that's how it looks. The Russian military is still business, business as usual. And, uh, and we have uh, the commander of the Ukraine ground forces, Sirsky, not Zaluzhny, Sirsky. He actually came out with a statement the other day, and uh, he said that the counteroffensive hasn't even started, the big counteroffensive. Sirsky actually said that what we are seeing are probing activities 
That's according to Sirsky. Quote, everyone wants to achieve a great victory instantly and at once, Sirsky told the, uh, what outlet? The BBC? I don't even know what outlet he told. Some British outlet. Sirsky. Ah, The Guardian. Ah, <laughs> The Guardian. Everyone wants to achieve a great victory instantly at once, Sirsky told The Guardian. And so do we, but we have to be prepared to have the process, to have this process take some time because there are a lot of forces massed on each side, a lot of material and a lot of engineered obstacles. Our main force has not been engaged in fighting yet, and we are now searching, probing for weak places in, in the enemy defenses, he continued. Everything is still ahead. Of course it is. Of course everything is still ahead. This is just a probing activity. 245 tanks lost, including a whole bunch of leopards. Probing. Just probing. <laughs> oh, boy. So this is the training area for the football club of uh, Larnica. Aik. That's their logo. Right there. Pretty nice. The Academy of Football. So uh, that was Sierski and Podoliak. This is kind of like a pre-clown world. Alensky's BFF Podoliak, he came out with, uh, with a statement. And he said that uh, people think this is some Netflix uh, TV show, according to Podoliak. He, uh, he offered a rebuke on Friday to anyone disappointed with the slow pace of the Ukrainian operation, declaring that combat was not a new season of a Netflix show. He then pointed the finger at Western countries, blaming them for the underwhelming results so far. The time lost in convincing our partners to provide the necessary weapons is reflected in the specific Russian fortifications built during this period, the deeply dug defense lines and the system of minefields, Podoliak stated in a tweet. The Ukrainian military leadership will make decisions based on military science and intelligence and not on the opinions of fans in the stands, he concluded. <laughs> this is coming from Podoliak. The Alensky regime that was putting out promo, promo films about the big counteroffensive, like a week before the big counteroffensive got underway, they were putting out Slick, uh, slickly produced videos on the counteroffensive and how it was starting, and you know the the military was doing this, you know, shh, and all of this stuff. That, that's the Alensky regime, and now they're coming out and saying, "This is no movie," like what Alensky told the BBC. This is no Hollywood script. And uh, Pitoli acts like, uh, you know, hey, yeah, uh, this is no Netflix show. Whatever, <laughs> whatever, man. So that's uh, that's the line that they're going with. This is not Netflix. This is not a Hollywood movie. And uh, let's see. What else? Ah, Obama. He gave an interview to uh, Christiane Amanpour. Sophisticated journalist, Christiane Amanpour. My name is Christiane Amanpour. I'm an international correspondent and a sophisticated journalist. And uh, Obama, he gave an interview to Christiane Amanpour. And he talked about Crimea and everything that happened during his watch in Ukraine, basically the Obama-Biden EU coup that occurred in uh, Ukraine that he orchestrated. He talked about that. He talked about how Merkel was, uh, played a key role in, in all of those events. And he told uh, Christiane Amanpour about how his administration and Merkel, what they did is they, essentially what he said is they bought time for uh, Ukraine so that they could properly arm themselves so that they could uh, they, they could take on Russia, and and uh, he was about he, he was about to talk about the siege of Kiev. That was that was where he was he was heading towards. He's like, you know, we what we did is is we bought Ukraine time, and uh, we got Europe to where it needed to be with sanctions, and we got the collective West to where it needed to be with uh, with sanctions and with military aid, and we helped build up Ukraine to uh, to the point where they were able to. To perform like they did during the siege of Kiev. That was pretty much what he wanted to say. And Christiane Amanpour was like, uh, Mr. Obama, Mr. Obama, uh, thank you for sitting down with me. Uh, my name is Christiane Amanpour. I'm an international correspondent and a very, very sophisticated journalist. 
uh, tell me about Crimea. And Obama was like, Crimea is Russia. <laughs> that was pretty much what Obama said. He, he said it in like a, you know, in a roundabout way. You know, Obama, you know, he's always very, very slick talking. But uh, he was like, look, you know, Crimea, what could we do? You know, there was a lot of Russians there and a lot of Russian speakers and they wanted to, to be a part of Russia. And so, you know, we we conceded that in order to to help. Uh, he said in order to give Ukraine their own identity and the Rada and, and then the rest of Ukraine and to build up Ukraine so that it could get to a position where it could eventually uh, take on Russia. That's pretty much what he told Christian Amanpour, sophisticated journalist, <laughs> international correspondent. So uh, let's see. Um, clown world. Clown world. Uh, let's talk about Andres Duda, walk on the wild side Duda, <laughs> the uh, president of Poland. So he was also giving an interview and uh, Duda he was actually talking to, I think, a bunch of reporters, actually. And Duda said that uh, him and Alensky, they have a love for each other. It's a deep love. <laughs> it's a deep, deep love. <laughs> and, uh, and he said that President Alensky and I love each other. But we are engaged in politics. <laughs> Whatever that means. I don't even know what that means. Anyway, he said that. So uh, that was what, that's what Duda told the journalists. And then he also said, with, uh, with regards to Russia, he said, you can't let Russia win because it will keep advancing. It will be a support for her imperialism. She is like a wild beast that devours a man. If a wild beast devours a man, it is usually said that it should simply be hunted down and shot. It is the same with Russia. It's a man-eater. Whoa, whoa, here she comes. She's a man-eater. <laughs> Duda, man. Duda's losing his mind. <laughs> I think this, uh, this conflict has, has, has made Duda lose his mind. <laughs> Walk on the wild side, Duda. Anyway, guys, that's the video. TheDuran.Locals.com I gotta walk towards the beach area, which is that way. So I'm going to walk all the way down that way and get this video up. Go to the Durant shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.